In August of 2019, an explosion rocked the Russian countryside, and it wasn't long before the radiation that leaked out tipped off the world that this was yet another failure in their efforts to field a nuclear-powered cruise missile. Nuclear propulsion really could give a missile practically limitless range, and that's exactly why the United States explored this in the 1950s and 60s, producing what was probably the most insane weapon in history. Let's talk about Project Pluto. I'm Alex Hollings, and this is Air Power. August 29th, 1949. It may not be a date that you had to remember for any history tests, but in a real way, it was a turning point for human civilization. You see, that's the day the Soviet Union conducted their first ever atomic weapons test, which means that's the day America lost its monopoly on the most destructive weapon system ever conceived by man. It was the beginning of this era we all now live in, where our survival is predicated on maintaining a delicate balance between nuclear powers, trying to avoid war to stave off Armageddon. And as cynical as it may seem, that doctrine of mutually assured destruction has managed to prevent large-scale war between nuclear powers for 77 or so years now. Of course, these days that peace feels disconcertingly temporary, but context can help with things like this, and it's important to remember that over the last seven-plus decades, the scales have come close to tipping more than once. And each time, either the Russian or the American or both governments were able to take actions that rebalanced the scales and brought us back from the brink. Sometimes these manifested as tense standoffs, but often they manifested as developing new capabilities and then deciding not to keep them. And we've covered programs like this before, like America's efforts to launch Minuteman 1 ICBMs out the back of airborne C-5 cargo planes. Once we proved we could do it, some began to voice concerns that this new offensive capability Russia had no response for could offset the scales and prompt them to launch a preemptive strike. And to some extent, the same can probably be said for Project Pluto and the absolutely insane slam missile that it powered. But let's get back to context, because from our modern vantage point, the Cold War between America and the Soviet Union seems like an exercise in overblown budgets and paranoia. But it's important to remember that at the time, many of the senior leaders in both D.C. and Moscow had not only seen one, but two world wars unfold during their lifetimes. And they had good reason to think that they were getting ready for a third. After the uneasy alliance between the Soviet Union and the rest of the Allies failed to last beyond the final shots of World War II, many thought a new global conflict would be coming along in very short order. But maybe most terrifying of all, the people who had their fingers on the proverbial nuclear buttons were all but sure of it. At the time, nukes weren't the lofty strategic weapons that they've become now, and many saw them as tactical weapons you can use to achieve strategic goals. That means that any conflict between the United States and the Soviet Union would have all but certainly began with a nuclear exchange. Now today, it's hard to wrap your head around the idea that people really thought about using nukes without considering the broader geopolitical ramifications. But at the time, the technology was still very new, and sort of like hypersonics today, people were still not quite sure how best to leverage this technology to achieve any kind of military goals. There were just a lot of question marks still in the air. And that sort of explains why, although the destructive force of the atom bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki had been so monstrous that they had changed the geopolitical landscape of the world forever, both the U.S. and Soviet Union immediately set about developing newer, even more powerful, thermonuclear ones. And that's not all. Under both flags, tons of programs popped up that sought to develop new weapons or new and dynamic delivery methods for the ones they already had. And these weapons ranged from ballistic missiles to unguided bombs to artillery and even backpacks. 
And it was that philosophical spiral down the nuclear drain that brings us to an Air Force weapon program dubbed the Supersonic Low Altitude Missile, or SLAM, not to be mistaken for the later AGM-84E standoff land attack missile. No, the SLAM program that we're talking about was going to utilize a ramjet nuclear propulsion system being developed under the name Project Pluto. Today, Russia's 9M730 Burevestnik, or Skyfall missile, aims to leverage the same nuclear propulsion concept. And as Russia's President Vladimir Putin has pointed out, nuclear propulsion really does offer practically endless range. Estimates at the time suggested that America's SLAM missile would likely fly for at least 113,000 miles before its fuel was expended. Based on those figures, that means the missile could literally fly around the entire planet at the equator at least four and a half times before it broke a sweat. Just to give you a bit of context, America's standard Tomahawk missile has a range of around a thousand miles, and America's Minuteman III intercontinental ballistic missiles have a range of around 8,000. The SLAM missile was to be powered by an unshielded nuclear reactor that would practically rain radiation onto the ground as it flew, which offered the first of at least three separate means of destruction that it could dish out. In order to more effectively leverage that seemingly unending range of the nuclear ramjet, the SLAM missile was designed to literally lob hydrogen bombs at targets as it flew, before finally, with its bevy of bombs expended, slamming itself into a final target, detonating its own thermonuclear warhead as it did. That final strike could feasibly be days or even longer after the missile was first launched. Over time, the SLAM missile that was being developed came to be known as Pluto by those who were working on it, due to the missile's development through the project of that same name. The nuclear ramjet developed for the SLAM missile wasn't all that different from the ramjets or scramjets developed today. It was designed to draw air in from the front of the vehicle as it flew forward at high speeds, which would create a significant amount of pressure. The nuclear reactor would then superheat that air and expel it out the back to create propulsion. In other words, a ramjet is a form of air-powered jet engine that uses the air flowing into its intake to create compression at subsonic speeds. A scramjet, like the propulsion systems being developed for today's hypersonic cruise missiles, works in a very similar way, except that it allows for supersonic airflow. The nuclear reactor that would heat this air produced more than 500 megawatts of power and operated at an absolutely scorching 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit. That's hot enough to compromise the structural integrity of metal alloys designed specifically to withstand high heat. So the decision was ultimately made to scrap metal internal parts altogether in favor of specially developed ceramic ones sourced from the Coors Porcelain Company, based in Colorado. Now, the downside to ramjet propulsion is that it really only functions well when already traveling at a high speed. So in order to reach those speeds, the SLAM missile would be carried aloft and accelerated by rocket boosters until the missile was moving fast enough for the nuclear ramjet to engage. Once the nuclear system was operating, the missile could remain aloft practically indefinitely, which would allow it to engage multiple targets or to avoid being intercepted by enemy air defenses, which is exactly why Vladimir Putin has touted Russia's nuclear-powered cruise missile as invincible. But having to get up to speed to start working is not the only thing that makes a nuclear-powered ramjet a questionable power source for a missile. You see, the SLAM missile was loud. And by loud, I mean that the missile's designers believed that the shockwave of it flying over you all on its own would likely kill anyone in its path. And if it didn't, the gamma and neutron radiation from its unshielded reactor sputtering fission fragments out the back probably would. This ludicrously dangerous propulsion system effectively made the SLAM missile's engine a weapon in its own right, but it also made flying the missile over friendly territory not only impossible, but also all but guaranteed that this weapon would receive significant geopolitical pushback. And while the doctrine of mutually assured destruction has now left us feeling as though the launch of just one nuclear weapon could start a cascade that would end the world, Project Pluto's SLAM missile was practically apocalyptic all on its own. And I'm not just talking about the radiation spewing out the back. You see, unlike most cruise missiles, which are designed with a propulsion system meant to carry a warhead to its target, 
Project Pluto's SLAM missile carried not just a nuclear warhead, but 16 extra hydrogen bombs that it could drop along its path to its final target. It wasn't long before some even suggested flying this missile in a zigzagging course across the Soviet Union, irradiating massive swaths of territory and delivering 16 thermonuclear warheads to different targets before throwing itself into a last one somewhere in the country. Now, this wouldn't just offer the ability to engage multiple targets. It would also almost certainly leave the Soviet population in an utter state of terror. I mean, we're talking about a low-flying missile spewing radiation out the back as it passes over towns, shattering windows and deafening bystanders, even killing some with its shockwaves, as it delivers nuclear hellfire to targets spanning the massive Soviet Union. This would have huge and far-reaching effects on morale. If your goal is to create a weapon so awful no one will risk going to war with you, Project Pluto was probably scary enough. All of this destructive power also posed a huge engineering hurdle for those developing the SLAM missile. I mean, how do you test a doomsday weapon? Any territory the weapon passed over during flight would be exposed to dangerous levels of radiation, which really limited the places in which the weapon's engine could even be tested. On May 14, 1961, engineers powered up the Project Pluto propulsion system on a train car in Nevada's National Security Test Site. The engine ran for just a few seconds, and then a week later, a second test saw the system run for a full five minutes. The engine produced 513 megawatts of power, which equated to around 35,000 pounds of thrust. Just to give you a bit of context here, that is 6,000 pounds of thrust, more than the F-16's Pratt & Whitney F-100 PW-229, afterburner and all. But these engine tests were really the only large-scale tests Project Pluto would ultimately ever see, in large part because a fully assembled SLAM missile would irradiate so much territory, it was difficult to even imagine a safe way of testing it. But probably fortunately for America's already fairly irradiated Southwest, that problem never had to be solved. The program had a litany of nails in its coffin, among them being the development of intercontinental ballistic missiles that could deliver nuclear payloads without irradiating half the globe in the process. And on top of that, by the late 1950s, the U.S. Air Force's fleet of heavy payload bombers was proving to have truly global reach. In 1957, three B-52 Stratofortresses became the first jet aircraft ever to circumnavigate the globe without stopping for fuel even once. They completed their historic mission, dubbed Operation Power Flight, in just 45 hours and 19 minutes, using the relatively new at the time process of in-flight refueling to stay aloft. Then, in 1961, the world's first operational nuclear-powered ballistic missile submarine, the USS George Washington, entered service with the U.S. Navy. The George Washington carried 16 Polaris A-1 submarine-launched ballistic nuclear missiles, which had been first tested just a few years prior, in 1959. Now, with this combination of ground-launched ballistic missiles, aircraft-borne weapons, and submarine-launched missiles sounds familiar to you, it probably should. We're talking about the basis of America's nuclear triad. If you're unfamiliar with that term, the nuclear triad is effectively America's nuclear deterrent insurance policy. It effectively ensures that no matter how devastating a nuclear attack on the United States may be, America has the means to respond and do the same to you, thus fulfilling its end of the mutually assured destruction bargain. And again, cynical as that may sound, mutually assured destruction has thus far staved off a nuclear Armageddon. As you can imagine, all of this was starting to make the insane SLAM missile start to seem exactly as insane as it really was. And to make matters worse, because the SLAM missile would irradiate, destroy, or deafen anything that it flew over or even near, that meant that not only could you not launch this weapon from U.S. soil, nor could you let it fly over any territory other than its target nation, that effectively left you with only one option. SLAM missiles could only be fired from directly on the Soviet border. Suffice to say, that's not exactly strategically handy. There was also the pressing concern that developing such a terrible weapon would really motivate the Soviet Union to respond in kind. 
Every time the United States unveiled a new weapon or strategic capability, the Soviet Union saw to it that they could match and deter that development, and of course, vice versa. So it was more than a good bet that America's nuclear-spewing apocalypse missile would probably prompt the Soviets to build their own nuclear-spewing apocalypse missile. So even if American decision-makers had chugged enough Cold War Kool-Aid to really love the idea of just dumping radiation all over the Russian countryside, few would be cool with the idea of that same thing happening over Washington, D.C. or Philadelphia. In other words, even though we're talking about America canceling one of its own weapon programs, what we're still really talking about is strategic deterrence. America hoped that by not pursuing such an awful weapon, the Soviet Union wouldn't either. In a real way, some weapons are just so awful that the whole world benefits from leaving them on the drawing board. If Russia ever does get their Skyfall missile working, it will represent a new strategic capability, but it won't pose as potent a threat as the SLAM missile. While you can all but guarantee that it will be a nuclear weapon, it isn't supposed to spew radiation out the back, nor does it lob any submunitions. Of course, that still doesn't make it a good idea. And on that ends yet another edition of Air Power from Sandbox News. I'm Alex Hollings. Make sure you swing by sandboxnews.com today and every day for all the latest in news, entertainment, and motivation from all around the force. If you got anything out of today's video, make sure to click like and subscribe below and leave me a comment so I know what I should cover next. And of course, don't forget to tap on that bell icon so you never miss a drop from Sandbox News.